Welcome back to Autism Live. We are joined right now by Bonnie Yates, special education attorney. She's coming to us from Kirji and Chow, an amazing law firm here in Southern California. Bonnie, welcome back to the show. Good morning. Good morning. Tell us a little bit about Hirji and Chow and how we can get a hold of them. Okay. So our website is lawyer, what is it, www.lawyer4children.com. Our phone number is 310-391-0330. Does anybody use the phone anymore? But anyway. Uh, um, I, shockingly, we all want to use the phone, but businesses don't give phone numbers out. So that's a wonderful thing to have a phone number of a business. Uh, well, yeah, it can be. I mean, I think, you know, for us, we are a service business, and it's important to us. If somebody is calling us, we want to make sure that that person feels acknowledged, you know. And, yeah. and, and, I mean, an email can work also, and they have certain convenience factors. But there's just some times when, you know, I like to talk to a live body. So, you know, we do offer that for clients. Um, I think what I'm supposed to say is we do special education and disability um, discrimination and we do higher education and we do regional center stuff. And basically, you know, I couldn't be prouder to be part of this six attorney firm where we just have the ability to do lots of things because there's lots of us and we share information and um, doing the show is one of those, you know, really just neat things we're able to do. So. Thanks to Autism Live, a little shout out to Autism Live, who seems to labor week after week and come up with incredible resources for people. And that's kind of, you know, a little bit about us, about Hirji and Chow. And we love you. Uh, we love you, you and we love Hirji and Chow. And so then we need a disclaimer uh, for talking about legal things here on the show. Yeah, we do. Okay, so your child has rights under state law, and that would depend on what state you're in. And your child also has rights under federal law, and the federal law applies to the 50 states. The IDEA um, is or was originally a federal program, and it's a federal statute, and the states are allowed to opt in if they want to. And if they take federal money, they have to offer special education and related services to students who qualify for them. So when we answer questions on this show, we are talking generally about people's rights under the IDEA, under federal and California law. And we do talk about specific problems, but it's in a general way, so we're not giving legal advice of a specific nature. And if you need legal advice of a specific nature, and you're in Southern California, we're happy to talk to you. That's something that we do all the time. We'll give you a complimentary consultation. If um, you are not in Southern California and you need help finding a lawyer who can help you negotiate the system, I would direct you to the COPA website. That's C-O-P-A-A dot net, Council of Parents, Attorneys, and Advocates. And actually, they're having their conference in New Orleans this week, and I'm sad not to be there because it's an opportunity to, you know, have a interesting uh, exchange with a lot of lawyers that do special ed and do it really well and have done it for a long time. And um, it just feels good to know that there's other people out there in the trenches. So absolutely, um, that's you know, COPA is a great organization for that reason. They train advocates too. I mean, they train parents, they train advocates, and they train professionals and you know, there's no such thing as too much training in this field, That's I right. think. Okay, so having said all that, we've got a bunch of questions. I'm going to launch in and uh, make our way down. So the first one, my son with an IEP for autism has recently been having accidents at school. It happened once, and even though he has an aid, they called me and asked me to bring him home, clean him, and change him. I did that because there was no change of clothes at school and I wasn't going to have him sit in it. Um, but I brought him back a change of clothes that could stay at school in case it ever happened again. Still, I was called to get come and get him three days later. I asked, couldn't they just change him and was told that the aide could not do that. Now it is IEP season and they want me to agree to a school aid because they can clean him up. The other aid couldn't do it because it was a private aid. Is this just another form of manipulation to get me to take their crappy school aid? Well, that question 
question sounds like something I would have said. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, this is a delicate area. I don't actually think that they are playing you necessarily. I think it's true. I mean, like, I've seen the contractual arrangements between the school district and, um, and let's say, in California, what we call a non-public agency to provide behavior intervention services. And those contracts do not specifically discuss the issue of what the aid will and won't do. I've, I've looked at a lot of them. I've never seen one that says the aid won't you know, help with toileting. But if the agency's position as a private agency is that they don't want their staff, they don't want to ask their staff to change uh, soil clothing because they feel that it's going to create a problem with their employees, I think that's a reasonable position. I don't think it's convenient, but I don't think it's unimaginable. But I think where all this is going is what kind of, you know, services are you getting from the private aid? Are they good? Are they ABA services? Because if they are, you shouldn't be required to give those up. Instead, the school should have to have a health aid available on campus so that when this student and or other students have accidents, um, the person can be changed. So you should not be required to give up your um, aid, which I'm hoping is a behaviorist, which is part of FAPE and part of your IEP, to get somebody to change you. And it is not appropriate to ask a parent to remove their child from school because of a toileting issue. That's just, you know, that's a non-starter. I suppose the immediate response should be, if you can do this, um, while this is getting worked out, you can come to school and change him or her, but you're not going to take him home and you're not going to stay there. But really, this is an IEP team discussion issue. I'm glad there's an IEP coming up. I think this needs to be discussed. Um, there shouldn't be any change in services without an IEP team meeting because that would be a change of placement without um, IEP team permission. Another question I have is why this child... Excuse me for one second. I'll be right back. My, my fireplace actually just dumped a bunch of wood on the floor. All right. So we'll, we'll, we're we're going to come second. back to me for a second. One sec. One sec. Uh, take, let's not burn the house down. Uh, all right. So, uh, but I, 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 I'm going to say, and can we cut her, uh, uh, well, I can mute her audio. Hello. How about if I do that so that we don't, um, okay. No, and see that means, I don't know how to mute, I can turn down my volume, I guess. Okay. It's technology things and she'll be right back. Um, but in any case, uh, I want to say to this parent, I still can't get it all the way off. Um, I, I want to say to this parent, I can take it off the speaker. I am not the smartest person on the. No, it's okay, Bonnie. Are you back? Alarming that it's a great thing. A fire safety. Yeah, not so much that. We're always having tech problems, like we're having computer meltdowns and things like that. This is just like a fireplace meltdown. But you know, I as much as I love this show and I like to be kind of dramatic sometimes for fun. <laughs> I'm sure it would go viral, uh, Bonnie, but we don't need that. We don't. We, we're, exactly. Right. Okay. So uh, where, where we were was this is yeah. an IP team decision. It is not something that should be done without um, an IP team discussing it. And my other question is, if this person has been uh, successfully toilet trained and is suddenly having accidents, I don't know what the age of the person is. But this is either a medical thing that needs to be looked into, or if it's only happening at school, what's happening at school that's making the student um, anxious or uncomfortable? Or, you know, I don't think it's just a question of sort of like who he's offloaded to, to, to change him. I think we also need to know, are there any factors that we think might be contributing to the problem? Well, and, and uh, honestly, I want to add to that, Bonnie, because I think, you know, the first accident, who knows why that happened, but if, if when I was in school, if I had had an accident and they had called my mother and said, come home and get me, and I got to come home and take a shower and change into new clothes and be with mom and have lunch at home, right. I, would, I would have had an accident every day to get out of well, school. Well, right. That's a very, that's a very good point. I'm 
also not clear on for the child um, whether even just having mom show up at school is so disruptive that yeah. that's not going to work. Yeah. But well, you need you need an IEP team meeting. Yeah. You need somebody to advocate for your son. There's kind of this whole. I think it's really immature behavior on the part of adults when it comes to things like toileting. Everybody's tiptoeing around like, oh, you know, it's right. so embarrassing. You know, it's just yeah. a fact of life, people, and, you know, eventually, you know, I'm going to be old, and unfortunately, somebody's probably going to be changing my diapers. It's just not that shocking. It's a problem. Right. Let's get practical. Let's solve it. Right. So, exactly. I'm right there with you. up safe okay. services to get a clothing change, okay? The school's going to have to work it out. Exactly. I love that answer. Okay, moving on to the next question. What do you do when the teacher clearly doesn't like your kid? I know it's the end of the year, and you're probably going to say let it ride until the end of the year, but I really think this woman dislikes my child. Does he have a right to a new teacher, and what do I have to say? Well, you know, we have this happen, and I'm sorry it's happening, and sometimes it doesn't happen at the end of the year, and sometimes the reason it happens is because other teachers poison the well, I certainly had that in my own child's case where, you know, the first grade teacher told the second grade teacher, wow, you know, this is really going to be a drag for you. Oh. And, um, and, and so that can be in play. Um, the teacher may just not be a good match with your child. It's also possible that, you know, the teacher is kind of punishing parent and child because the child has an IEP, requires more help, or because parents have been engaging in um, advocacy on behalf of the child. It's been really disappointing to me to see how adults, trusted adults, sometimes retaliate and, and behave very inappropriately. But the practical problem you face in this situation is if you don't have any proof, it's going to be hard to do anything about this. And, you know, I can be kind of mean and I can be kind of aggressive and I can, you know, pull a teacher into an IEP and I can shame them. I can definitely do that. I can make them cry, I can make them upset, I can make them go to their union, but that's not going to make them be any nicer to, to your child. And so I guess what you could do, I mean, the, I don't know that anything you're going to do is going to be successful, and as much as the teacher doesn't like your child, and that's really a drag in terms of, uh, we know that educators have to have a, a positive bond with children in order for children to learn effectively in their class. But I'm just trying to imagine some scenarios. Maybe, Shannon, you have some thoughts, too. I would try having a nice meeting first with the teacher and flatter her and praise her up and maybe bring her a little present. Just ask her how it's going. See if you can get her to open up. Maybe she's just really stressed because she has too many kids in her class with IEPs, not enough support. And see if you can establish some rapport with her. Um, if you can't do that, you can go talk to the principal, but the principal is going to, you know, say, you don't have any proof, and she's a wonderful teacher. They're going to back their person. So I don't really know what you can do that's going to get you a nicer teacher. I know you, I, you know, you can document things. You can save them for the next year. You can use them at future IEPs, but you can't make somebody be nice to you. And Eventually, bad behavior, I suppose, rises to the level of bullying, but until it does, you can't even make teachers be nice to children in California. It's kind of shocking, but there's no law that says teachers need to be pleasant to other people. Yeah. So I think, you know, if you can work with the teacher, and I've had so many interactions over the years with people in special ed who were so hostile, and I, I knew it wasn't just me. I knew it was the way that they, you know, they encountered and dealt with the whole world and there is sometimes a sweet spot for that situation where you can befriend sort of the unfriendable person and they will become a totally different person if and you I, become some you know somebody that is sympathetic and, and trustworthy but i can't guarantee you can do that some teachers are pretty far gone and i think that you know that's exactly the right thing to start with at this point is see see if you can't make some headway with the teacher um, but I know I gave one teacher so many tries, and we got right to the end of the school year, and, you know, it, it was not working. We limped along to the last couple of weeks, and, and it's one of the things I regret. 
um, that I gave her so many tries. I, I think for this parent, I'm going to tell you, I don't know if you can switch teachers, and I don't know if the teacher that you would go to would be any better, and that's a problem. Well, the principal, I'm sorry to interrupt you, I should have answered that. The principal can do anything she or he wants to, but they're, yeah. they're very reluctant to make that switch. How does the new teacher feel getting the student? Yeah. The old teacher doesn't feel backed up. It's just not likely to happen unless the principal's already just done with the teacher. She's having a lot of complaints, and she's just kind of trying to you know, shore up the, the yeah. you know, the falling wall or whatever it is. But there are so, some, we talk all the time about antecedent modifications to make sure, you yeah. know, that things don't happen. I, I can tell you some antecedent modifications that I learned over the years that Let's hear this is the time of year when they will have some sort of a night at your school in all likelihood where you get to visit and see all the projects that the kids were working on. And we would always go to our son's, uh, they call it open house or back to school night or whatever in the spring. And um, we would go to see our son and the work that he did and our teacher. We'd spend a couple of minutes there and then we would run to the next year's classes so that we could meet all the teachers, see the projects that they were doing, watch them interact with parents, watch them interact with their kids so that we would have an idea of which teacher that we wanted. Mm -hmm. And at the end of every school year, I anybody who has gone above and beyond and been wonderful, whether it's the OT, the speech person, the teacher, or now I have multiple teachers, I, somebody gave, it might have been you, Bonnie, who told me to do this, but I write a letter of recommendation for that person and outline all the things that they did that were wonderful. I give them a copy of it. I give it to their principal and send one to the district to put in their file. And I then, think that's really nice, Shannon. And, I don't think I suggested that, but I think it's a great idea. Well, somebody gave me that idea, and what I found once I started doing that, word got out that, mm -hmm. oh, if you're great to this kid and to this mom, this mom writes letters and it goes in your permanent mm -hmm. thing. I get thank yous from the teachers. I get, par I get uh, principals saying, hey, I'm glad to know that that teacher was so awesome. Mm -hmm. it, honestly, that has been the best thing to ensure that my son gets good teachers <laughs> that like him mm -hmm. and are willing to take time with him. But for this year, I tell you, if there's one thing I could change, I know I would go back and I would rip him out of that woman's classroom and say, you don't get to talk. She took so much opportunity to talk my son down that it took a year to get back what she made him lose. I'm still mad at her. So, uh, you know, I, I think there have been other times when I've gone to a teacher and found, oh, this teacher is wonderful and I've just misunderstood. Once we were on the same page and I'm glad mm -hmm. I took the time to know that. But if you try and this teacher, I would do everything I could to get him out of the classroom if she's really not going to like your kid and not going to work with you on it. Because a teacher can tear a kid's self to seem, seem down so far. Mm -hmm. Ugh, terrible. Yeah, I'm not I helpful. Mean, I think your point's really well taken. And as I was considering the question and giving the answer, you know, the legal system can't fix every single kind of problem. And it may yeah. seem strange that I'm telling you, you know, go take the teacher like a basket of fruit. But I just know there's so many people out there, um, you know, within the system they feel unappreciated, they feel ignored, they feel not supported, and they feel overwhelmed. And it doesn't mean they're really going to change their stripes that much necessarily, but they may focus on somebody else, yeah. you know, instead of your kid. If you can so, repair it, it's the best thing to do. Yeah. But, but I, I there's think... There's certainly nothing I can do. There's no motion I can file. There's no headstand I can do that can force a teacher to be mean to your kid. Well, and... But, you know, I do call people out at IEP meetings sometimes, but usually by the time I do that, we're in due process, and I'm pretty done with them, and I have very low expectations. And then the, the, the tactic is different, which is you want this person to feel uncomfortable so that they don't want to testify, so that the district's going to want to settle the case. So that's a whole different scenario. Oh, lawyers are such interesting people. But this has reminded me of a case uh, a couple of years ago that a mom wrote in and said... Uh, some pretty extraordinary things that the teacher had done and she was saying can you recommend because we talk all the time during teacher appreciation week about giving trainings from IBT the Institute for Behavioral Training to your teacher it's like the gift that keeps giving you're giving the teacher a gift 
And if it's a good teacher, teachers like to learn, but it also helps your child. So the parent had written in and said, I'd like to gift an IBT training to this teacher mm -hmm. to teach her how to use positive reinforcement instead of constantly mm -hmm. punishing. So I had written to Cecilia Knight, and Cecilia said, well, tell me what's going on that she wants to address so that I can pick a video for her. And I told her, and she said, oh, I don't have a video that te teaches a person how to be a good person. Yeah. You know? But you know what? I mean, we all lead by example a little yeah. bit every day, and we try to be good people. And I think our examples, you know, have tendrils that we might not be aware of. I can also see a teacher feeling very defensive yeah. being given a gift like that because they're, they are they are scared about the fact that they don't really know too much about autism. You know, so yeah. it, it, some people are very open. You know, some people are non-defensive. It just, it's, it's really a specific situation and a lot more discussion is required before deciding you know how to make it through the rest of the year Certainly, but i but i agree with you close to the end of the year when when the die is cast i would go talk to the principal and say it's going to be very important next year for, for our child to have a positive experience can we partner on this what can we do that's the best advice right there Okay, I'm going to move on to this next question. Uh, well, we, you know what? We dealt with this a little bit la last week, so I'm going to move on to the one after then. Uh, okay. okay, here's a good one. My son has made so much progress, he no longer needs support in the classroom. I'm thinking of letting the IEP go. I actually think it's hurting him because the only mistakes that are, are made are forcing him to take service he doesn't need or want. Uh, and, but the teacher makes him do so because he has an IEP, and she assumes that all people have the same IEP. She is the one who needs support, not my son. If I let the IEP go, can I let it all go, or do I need to start with a 504 plan? I know you're not a big fan of the 504, right? No, I'm not, because I don't really think... I think they're kind of advisory, but I think they don't get followed or considered. Or I mean, I'd want to know why... What is the 504 plan for at this point? If you think the child doesn't need any services, are you saying the child still needs accommodations? If that's true, that involves teacher involvement. Um, let me ask, let me answer a basic question, which may or may not be sufficient to answer this person's question. Nobody can implement an IEP without your consent. If you withdraw your consent to the IEP, the district has two choices. They can either acquiesce or if they feel that it's wrong and they feel that they need to have an IEP in order to offer faith to your um, student, your child, then they have to file for hearing and get an order and, 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 and obtain the right to continue to implement the IEP. I don't think they're going to do that, probably. I mean, unless there's right. something really you know, bad that we're not being told that the school is fearful about, they'll probably be happy to get rid of the IEP. Um, and I and I don't think, I, if you can give us some more information, we could have a discussion next week about whether there's any benefit for you with a 504 plan. Um, but it, in my experience, not knowing your child, assuming your child has autism, not knowing your child's age, um, I would just want to have a more focused discussion about whether everything's really good or there are more kind of behavioral deficit areas or social areas that still need attention. You know, okay. I, I don't I don't really see for the most part kids having autism and then they they do so well that they have no issues anymore ever. Uh, but that's just me. Okay. You know, and, and I don't tend to meet the kids that um, don't need help anymore because their parents don't tend to seek me out, if that makes any sense. Yes, but ironically, because of, you know, who you are and not you know, not to impinge too much on other people's privacy, but, you know, you are a mom who's featured in a DVD called Recovered, and so uh, you're a person that I would run to for that advice because you've gone through personally the experience of having a child um, grow up and uh, essentially lose their diagnosis or, uh, I don't know, I don't want to impinge on that privacy. Well, no, I mean, I we could have a general discussion and maybe this is where we pick up next week what I think what I've seen is that sometimes children or young adults 
get to a point where whether they are completely re recovered and their diagnosis no longer has any bearing on who they are, I think that a lot of people get to the point where they're like, I want to try this on my own. I want to be my own person. Yeah. I don't want to have somebody instructing me all the time. And that's not really, it's not really clear to me from the question what the school is doing that mom doesn't want them to do. But I would just say to her generally, is there not still a role for social skills in your child's program? Do you really feel that that core deficit area in autism is remediated, or is it just that you don't think the school has the capacity to address it? I mean, maybe the, the listener could send in some more details and we could have a more informed discussion about it. And I mean, another interesting correlate to this or related subject is parent, when a parent comes to you and says, um, should I tell my child that they have a diagnosis of autism? Very interesting and starts happening as the kids get to be teenagers, right? Yeah. And you know, they start having more awareness about their right. Hope you're so it's, a little bit. It's, it, give us some more facts and okay. we can discuss it some more. I think it's a very important topic. Absolutely. Uh, we've had two uh, more things. One that came in last week in, re in reference to what you were saying. Uh, question for Bonnie Yates. Is a transitional plan only required if the child is going the non-diploma option? Also, if we do the diploma route and it's too much for him, can we return to the public school until he's 22? Okay. Transition is a word that's used a lot for a lot of different things. So you could talk about things like a transition from kindergarten to first grade, a transition from A school to B school, a individualized transition plan to be put in place by the child's 16th birthday. That's what they but, were referring to, because you were talking yeah, about the so, ICP. I mean, people talk about there's no transition plan or something, and, and like what they're talking about then is, you know, that maybe if a child is being introduced into a new school or something, there has to be a ramp up. That's not what we're talking about. We talked about that another time. There is a legal document, you know, a legal vehicle called the Individualized Transition Plan. We've talked about it before on the show. Perhaps that's spurring the question. Yeah. The answer is everybody who has an IEP, whether they're diploma track or non-diploma track, must have an Individualized Transition Plan, ITP, in place by their 16th birthday, and it can be done as soon as their 14th birthday. If you are on diploma track and you graduate with a high school diploma, unless you file for due process before you graduate, um, contesting the, the appropriateness of your graduation, the re the, you're, you're contesting the lack of readiness for graduation, you will graduate and the district will owe you no more IDEA services. However, if you're on a diploma track, but you're moving more slowly than other students, you can take more time to graduate. You could have, you know, in theory, a 13th grade or a 14th grade and so on. If it turns out that you're completing the work and you're just graduating high school late with a diploma, let's say you're 20, that will end your special ed entitlement. But if instead you're on a diploma track and it is not working, let's say you get your student tested and you find out that the student is actually not reading on a high enough level to be passing the classes that the school says he's passing, you can convene an IEP and take him, ask to take him or her off diploma track. It's still an IEP team decision, but in general, I think people should be aware, they should be wondering, is my kid on diploma track or certificate of completion and is that right? And if not, don't wait till the last moment to address it because that's too late. Okay. All right. So, and then somebody wrote in and said, you can write in the IEP. And I don't know what they were referencing, but yeah, you can. I mean, you've taught us here on the show that you can write things in the IEP and um, put comments in. Something that I had not known before that I could say that I, you know, am agreeing to the IEP, but here are my concerns. Um, right. for future years, and that's a piece that I never knew before, Bonnie, but it's a very powerful piece. Well, there would be no reason for you to have been taught it, but the truth of the matter is this is a, a document that's supposed to be developed by all members of the team, including parent, 
the boxes and things can be confusing, and um, I don't always like to go that route. So sometimes what I will do is I will write on the document, I'll make like three or four asterisks, and I will put C attached letter dated blah, blah, blah. And then I will send the letter and ask that it be attached to the IEP. But we do that all the time. We, we, we don't just put a check in the bo- uh, X in the box and go on with life. We always give feedback about all the components of the IEP that we have comments about. Okay. Because if we don't make those comments, then later the school can come back and say, oh, we didn't realize you were concerned about speech or, right. you know, graduation or whatever it is. So um, nobody can force you to sign the IEP. Um, nobody can tell you you can't comment on it. I used to I used to have this trick. I thought it was like so kind of mad men where if a mom would go to an IEP by herself and they would try to arm twist her into signing it, I would just tell her to tell them, like, I have a very traditional husband, and he makes me review everything with him before I can sign anything. <laughs> but that's a little sexist. So then I realized that parents should just say, you know, I understand under IDEA my, I have rights, and that includes the right to a reasonable amount of time to consider the IEP, and so I haven't had lunch, and my blood sugar's low. I'll be getting this back to you in the next few days. Well, you know, what I would always say is, uh, you know, we pay a lot of money to keep an attorney on retainer. We don't bring them to the meeting. But she tells me that if I sign this without her reviewing it, that she'll stop, uh, you know, uh, helping us. She'll so, drop me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? You can, so. You know, yeah, any of those, anything can work. Yeah. I mean, be honest, be honest whenever you know, as honest as you can be whenever you can be, but also don't let people, like, push you yeah, around. You're yeah. not a kindergartner, you Absolutely. know? Absolutely. Let's mean, not even push the kindergartners around. But well, that's true. When you're <laughs> dealing with people that exi- that have worked in an environment for a long time where they tell people what to do, and those people are, like, four feet tall, and then they say, okay, and they go sit down at their desk. Right. It's not exactly that kind of exchange when you're developing an exactly. IEP. Exactly. And Bonnie, we've gone past time, and I've got guests that I uh, that I desperately want to get to. Okay. Although I love the time spending with you, tell us again how we can get a hold of your G and Chow. Well, I think instead, what I'm going to tell you is, I promise next week, no okay. more explosions from my fireplace. Uh, I'm going to get a handle on. It that. was kind of fun. Um, what are you talking about? But, it kind but, of, you know, I mean, I see everybody's using like these fire emojis right now, so I would just say, like, fire emoji, fire emoji. Um, our, our phone number is 310-391-0330. If you're in Southern California, we'd love to give you a complimentary consultation. Keep sending the questions. You guys are the best, and we'll keep answering You're them. You're the best, um, Bonnie. We appreciate you so much. Thanks so a lot, much. Thanks for okay. being with us. Have a good weekend. Have a great day, everybody. All right, okay. bye-bye. Bye. Okay, you guys, I'm really sorry because we're late. Uh, We want to, but that was a fun discussion, but I want to get to the next fun discussion. So we're going to take a break and then we're going to be back with Monica and Aaliyah Wisco. I know you guys are going to love this, so stick with us. 